1915, the federal government decides the way we're building airplanes in the United States just isn't working. Well, why? It's a bunch of, it's a hodgepodge of individuals hand making their own designs. There's no uniformity. Nobody knows what the other guy's doing. If the Wright brothers are building an airfoil and Glenn Curtis is building an airfoil, they have no way to tell each other what their airfoils look like or what the shape is. Now, this is a big problem because in 1915, everybody knew World War I was going on over in Europe and they knew that we would be involved eventually. So they form the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. And this is an all-star committee. Orville Wright is on this committee. That tells you how good it is, okay? When a guy who invents how to fly is on your committee, you've got a good committee. Eventually, this federally formed unit starts to do its mission, which is the scientific study of the problems of flight with a view to their practical solution. Basically, they want to figure out how to let everybody know what the problems are and how you can solve them. And one of the things they came up with is a way to name airfoils. Different people have been hand-making airfoils, literally carving them out of wood and putting canvas, or in this case, in most cases, um, a, a uh, cotton fabric, which they would then put sealant on it called dope. Dope is wonderful, except it's very flammable and you don't want that in your World War I airplanes. That's why a lot of them burn. So the NACA, uh, or actually NACA, they didn't pronounce it NACA until after it was pretty much closed up. The NACA comes up with a method of putting families of airfoils together. And the first thing we're going to deal with is the NACA four-digit airfoil. This comes about in about 1933. There are four digits that name your airfoil and they tell you how to make it. The first digit is the maximum camber as the percent of cord. Now I'm going to stand up here and show you what I'm talking about. Remember this camber is the curve. The maximum camber is the maximum change in between the cord and the camber line. And that is going to be measured as a percent of the length. So if you have a wing that has a 10-foot cord length and you have a camber of 3%, you take 3% of 10 feet, and that's how much you bend the wing. And that makes it easy for people to make, okay? Now the second distance, that digit, is the distance of where this max camber occurs. And what they do is they take the cord length and they measure it off in tenths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if we have a 3% camber and it occurs at the 30% mark, which would be right here, we know to measure 3% up at the 30% and then we can draw our curve like that. Okay? Now, the last two digits of the NACA four digit airfoil. So here we have a 3%, and it occurs at 30%. Okay? And then the last number is the thickness of the airfoil around that camber line compared to the length. So this is 10% as thick as it is long. So we'd measure one of those units and we would go five above that line and five below the line. And now we have the airfoil. So this would be the NACA 3310. A little bit fat and a little bit pushed forward, but it has some uses. Every different change in the airfoil will have a change in how it flies. And we're gonna talk about a really important one, and as an example, you're going to get to watch me draw this airfoil, okay? We're going to be doing the NACA, I'm sorry, we're going to be doing the NACA 2412. Usually we describe it as two digits. 2412. We don't use 2412, we just say the 2412. This is an important airfoil 
because most of the Cessna airplanes, like the Cessna 152, the 172, have it. Uh, Curtis Wright used it on some of his 1930 biplanes, one of which was this big biplane that was used as a cargo plane. Imagine a big biplane with the second wing above the body, two big engines, and then this just huge hole for a, uh, for a cargo bay. Uh, there was a racing airplane that used this. It was called the Loving. It was hand-built out of wood, but no glue, no nails. I don't know how the guy did it. It's amazing. And then the Luscombe 90 was a uh, just a little puddle jumper of an airplane, and it was used a lot by people who had ranches and things like that. So it's a very good low-speed airfoil, provides a fair amount of lift, and it's cheap and easy to make. So we're going to make it. It's the 2412. So if you remember, the first number is a 2, and that tells me we're going to have 2% of a curve. Now I want you to look at this paper that I've drawn here. You can use just a good old piece of graph paper, but I draw these all the time. See, I've got percent over here, and that's a percentage of the cord length, and I've got it all the way out from zero to one here. So this is the two percent line here. That's going to be the maximum point where our camber curves to. But where, Mr. Parks? At the 40 percent mark. So here's the 40% mark, and I'm going to go up 2. That is my max point of curve. Everything else, well now I'll try to freehand it. We wouldn't freehand this if we were really putting it together. We have a series of equations to control this curve, but here we go. There's usually a little circle that helps to find the nose, and I just draw it like that, and then I have the line coming off of that. There it is. And now it's got to go all the way to the tail. So there is our camber. It is 2% of the length of the wing, and it occurs at 40%. That means the wing's going to be facing that away. And now, it's a 12% thick wing. What's half of 12? That's right, 6 each. So I'll count 6 down. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then I'll count 6 up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there's the top. And there's the bottom. And now, once again... And then we'll go all the way back to the tail. And then I have a less of a slope here. And there's our wing. This is our airfoil here. I can start drawing it in better. You see how it's kind of plump? Plump airfoils deliver a lot of lift at low speed. And this airfoil is designed for airplanes that are only going to do maybe two, three hundred miles an hour at most. There it goes. The underside is flatter and that provides that surface that the air gets to bounce off of. Remember. If the air hits the wing, Isaac Newton says we'll have an equal and opposite reaction. So when the air hits the bottom of this wing, and you see what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some angle of attack on it. There we go. So you can see how the airflow is hitting the bottom of the wing, just like this pencil. And it'll bounce off of it, and the air going over the top will have to speed up and flow around it. So once you've made... And I want to make this an assignment, so you all make sure you do this. Now, don't anybody scamp on me. Once you have set up a piece of graph paper, you can go out 10 blocks or 20 blocks and make each of these a half of, of a, a 0 0.05. Whatever you do, just make sure that you can measure in both directions. 
and then you can pick yourself a number. So if you pick yourself a 4308, let's think about this. 4% camber at the 30% mark. One, two, three. 4% camber. This thing has a lot of curve to it. Look at that. And then, but it's only 8% thick, and that's already 4%. So 4% up, 4% down. This thing's flat on the bottom. Look at that. That is a real old-timey airfoil from like the teens or the 20s. This kind of airfoil, I'll hold it up here. This airfoil looks a lot like an airfoil called the Clark Y, which is one of the most famous. And literally, people just hand drew it and then put that paper over wood and cut the wood out of it, and that made the wing. But you can pick any four numbers and then draw your airfoil. If this number right here gets too big, you get a very fat airfoil. I have had people put in like, ooh, let's do an 8 Two twenty. Seriously? Think about that. One, two, and eight percent. And then it's twenty percent thick. Looks like a beluga whale. Look at that. Okay? Some airfoils don't have any camber at all. Since they don't have any camber, they will be listed at zero zero. And then the XX here is just how thick they are. These symmetrical airfoils mean they're just as thick on one side of the cord as they are the other. And we use these for tail surfaces, okay? See how it's symmetrical around this line? So this is used for stabilizers, and it's also used for a lot of helicopter wings. Helicopters have wings. They just spin them around over their head. So these symmetrical airfoils get all of their lift by tilting into an angle, and that's what they control from the cockpit. See that? So these are symmetrical airfoils. That means they're the same on both sides. Symmetrical. So I'd like for you to try a few. Get a piece of graph paper. Pick some reasonable numbers. Maybe you can find a favorite airplane of yours and look up what... if. If you can find the NACA four-digit number, there are four-digit airfoils, five, six, seven, eight, and then we get into weird ones like the one I flew in the F-14 was the 64 AO 65.55, I think it was. And then they changed it for later models. Every different airfoil, airfoil numbering system has different ways to make a family of airfoils that have kind of the same shape. So the NACA four series is going to be a low-speed uh, airfoil. The five-digit series, which we can talk about on our next lesson, was used for a lot of the airplanes in World War II and a lot of the famous ones that you already know. So do a little research on your own. There are YouTube videos on this, besides mine. And try to draw a few of your own. You can try to draw a piece of paper like this and get a really good airfoil, or you can use it on a good piece of graph paper. The quarter-inch paper works just fine for it. As long as you mark it off, in tenths along the cord length and percent of that length here. So notice that 10% is the same as this 0.1. You see that? So I've just taken this 0.1 and split it in two pieces here. You can draw your airfoils all day and I'd like for you to give it a try. It's a lot of fun and more importantly you start showing that to a STEM person at a college when you're trying to get into You say, yeah, I've been uh, designing a few of my own airfoils here. <laughs> watch the admission papers flow. Because everybody's gonna go, this guy designs his own airplanes and he's not even a freshman yet. Can we have him in our school, please? Okay? I hope you've enjoyed it today. I'll try to do more of these videos and do them better. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye.